you know, you need to mute or whatever. No, that's our, uh, our, our go live chat. Yeah. So, yep. Sent out the announcement. I've got my uh, pre show checklist. Um, that's everything. Looks like we got two on. Yeah. yeah. See if we get some uh, comments in the chat to see if we're there. They are. There we are. Yeah. The student Sage. Yes, because oh. I am in student mode right now. And Jim, I, I need to get back to you. You, you had a question to me. I forgot. Um, yeah. A oh, boy. AJ, EC, boy. Yeah, yeah we got the uh, OB oh, man. bingo board. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Nate, I like this pattern that's behind you. What's going on there? You know, I just wanted something for my talking head stuff for my YouTube stuff. And I found this arts and crafts kind of website and, and there it is. So it's like felt designs. Oh, felt, okay. Felt things. It looks really good. Yeah. Thank you. I need to work in my lights at some point. So it's not just like surgically bright in here when I'm on the video. <laughs> Live from yeah. aisle 13 at Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have the spectrum. Brian's got the mood lighting. That's, yeah. uh, being spotlighted by a ufo and i'm just somewhere in <laughs> yes. between yeah and nate's got the uh the green turned all the way up yeah, yeah. Like, El that's a new name yeah, yeah. it's like saint patrick's day over on nate's uh side yeah. there you know el Kiro means that uh, the Kiro. just passing that on <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you spoke spanish <laughs> awesome all right well let's just you know do the thing well, let's, let's do, do it, it. Yeah. It's uh, it's eight oh one. Yes. All right. Let's go. Welcome to episode 53 of the Midlife Pilot Podcast. It's a podcast where we talk all things aviation for those who are starting their aviation journey in midlife. This podcast is about sharing our experiences and the greater community's experiences as a midlifer. So whether you're a student pilot, a seasoned veteran, or an enthusiast who maybe wants to learn, we're glad you're with us. My name is Ben. I'm an instrument rated pilot here in the Atlanta area flying a Cessna 182. Hopefully finishing up the commercial rating this week. With me, as always, we have Brian in the heart of Music Row. Right in the middle of it. Yeah, Right yep. in the middle of it, flying yep. a Cherokee. Brian, how you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, if you listen carefully, you can probably hear uh, bach bachelorettes screaming or... or um, <laughs> uh, Parading or around with their white claws. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I do have some more of those white claws in the fridge. I, do you want me to go get one? Should I get one just as a prop? I think or? you should oh, save yeah. them for April. Okay. That's well, that's prop. not going to be too yes. hard. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> also with us tonight, we have Ted, sport pilot extraordinaire from Portland, Oregon, flying a CTLS, the, what we like to call the plastic egg. Hey, Ted, how's it going? The egg doing well. Yeah. Weather's been terrible, but uh, I noticed uh, two of my friends were out flying today because it was like, it's the first flyable day in like 10 days. And I had thought about skipping the podcast to go fly. So I flew today for a business meeting down in Columbus. And when I got back, the manager of our tower is a guy that I, from my hometown. And he told me that uh, he was getting off his shift and I saw him in the parking lot. And he said, we have over 100 IFR tickets sitting up in the cab right now. Everybody feels like it's they're abandoning ship or maybe they're coming in. I don't know, but it's it was pretty busy out there today. It was the first pretty wow. day we've had in a, in a little while. So very cool. Um, if you're we'd like um, 
to let everybody know, we stream every Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time at youtube.com slash at Midlife Pilot Podcast. We have a live chat. It's open for questions and comments. The audio version of this podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you're, you get your podcast from. Please, please subscribe and uh, go to either Apple or Spotify and leave us a five-star review. Uh, if it's, we'd love to be able to read it on the podcast. We have a, an amazing discord community. You can send us an email at midlife at podcast at gmail.com and ask to be invited. We'll send you an invitation and you can join an amazing group. And we have a merch store. Um, Ted, are we okay on the merch store right now? <laughs> you said we have a merch store. And it's like, well, about that. We don't <laughs> have a merch store right now. Uh, uh yeah technical difficulties uh which is fine so we're working it'll be through up in, yeah, probably be up in another week or so um it just makes it more rarefied if you already have something yeah we're and trying if, to if, yeah, for if those that have already yeah right if you're desperate and you want to sh if you want a shirt one of the shirts that we've got or something email us hit us up on discord we can we can get some of those drop shipped out to you but otherwise we'll have the store up in hopefully a week yeah and what we're trying to do is raise the value of everything so because nobody can buy anything now so that's that's what we're really trying to do um tonight we have with us uh someone who i'm proud to call a friend nathan ballard who is a cf double i here in the atlanta area we got a couple of feedbacks and we just thought it'd be a great idea uh to bring someone on who actually knows what they're talking about for the right, first Brian? time ever on the midlife file <laughs> right. i'm gonna raise our our um accuracy score yeah um so Nate, welcome to the podcast. We're glad you're with us. Thank you, Ben, Brian, Ted, and all the people in the chat that we see on Discord all the time. It's nice to like be a part of this live. Really glad to have you. Um, I thought we'd start out, and guys, jump in if you want to do something different. But um, we got two pieces of feedback, or actually three, that I, I just kind of wanted to touch on. We can read them. And then, Nate, you can react. Tell us what you think. And we just we can start out there and see where it takes us. How does that sound? Yep. Yeah. Let's let's do it. All right. So we got feedback from um, Biff B. In keeping with the midlife theme, I think it'd be interesting to have a CFI talk about their experiences in training midlifers versus others. What it what's is possibly easier or more of a struggle in their experience. They could talk about PPL or instrument or whatever. But the, the question, I guess the heart of the question is, um, you are an instructor at a flying club uh, out of Lima Zulu uniform. And I imagine you get all, all types. So it, is, is there a big difference training? As old types? Um, there is, and I've, and I've done um, some instruction at a flight school as well. So I've seen, I've seen it a lot. And just for everybody listening or watching, watching, I've got about a thousand hours of dual given, which to me makes me wow. feel like I'm just getting started. Like I've learned so much <laughs> in that first hundred, 200 hours. And like, I, I learned something new every time. The one, the one, like one of the things that I think is really different about, you know, I, we'll say people who are pre midlife and midlife pilots is that the midlife pilots, I'd say 95% of them have the motivation, the drive to get it done, right? They're going to, they come prepared. You know, if you're, if you ask them to do something, they're going to do it. They know the value of time and money and they don't want to waste either of those. Um, so I'd say probably the experience of working with someone who's midlife from an instructor standpoint, you know, they're going to show up ready to work. Well, so we understand more so the value of time and money, but <laughs> on the opposite end of that sort of balance um we know it's probably going to take us a little more time and a little more money um or at least actually you know what maybe we don't know that so maybe that's a good next question for you is sort of because i yeah. think i was one of these for sure where i just thought i i have kinesthetic awareness i've done a lot of studying ahead of this i really think that i'm going to have a knack for this I think that I'm going to be able to just jump right in and feel right at home. And it couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, and I remember just even taxiing on my first lesson <laughs> and just, 
and struggling with just, you know, keeping it on the line or whatever. And, and I just thought, oh boy, I, I, you know, I was overwhelmed. So was that, was that free castering, Brian? Before Nate, I got, got a, it was, was uh, free castering or is it steering? It was a, it, it was idiot castering. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, which is, I guess, technically called bungee castering. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was just a 172. So, um, but I guess my question for you, Nate, would be, um, while I do appreciate that you think that we are more responsible and I was definitely, re- I was well, you know, planned and studied and prepared, but I wasn't prepared for what I wasn't prepared for. And, and that's, that is a good point. I mean, I, and I'm, while we talk of midlife, I'm, I'm not good. That is something that is different. The younger folks or less seasoned, we'll say they are more malleable, right? They're, they don't have some of those biases that we have after, you know, 20, 30, 40, however many years in our, in our lives that, you know, that we do. So when I've encountered something like that, I always try to bring it back to something that the person knows, like Brian, you're, you're in music, right? So I would try to, I would try to make, make the connection between music and flying to try to help that person bridge that gap and maybe eliminate some of those biases. You know, does it work? I don't know, Ben. You you know, you could maybe say yeah, that works or not. But part, of, I think part of my problem, and and you probably have seen this because Nathan is actually my CFI for my commercial rating. Um, and you probably showed up a little bit of this in the TA airplane that we flew. But you know, I think we set as midlifers, we set a very high level of expectations on ourselves. And when we don't hit those expectations, we're also probably a lot harder on ourselves, which creates its own sets of problems. I remember um, the first landing when I was doing my PPL that I the basically my instructor's hands were completely off rudder and yoke. I mean, I greased it. And I was kind of pissed off about it because I didn't learn anything from it. And I started I knew it was going to be downhill from there. And I just had that mindset, and of course, that happened, and and I, we we worked our way out of it. Um, when we you went our way out of a good landing, yeah, I did. <laughs> um, as as weird as it may sound, but because I knew it was going to happen, maybe it was self defeating. But um, you know, I when we were flying together, flying an autopilot that's so much more capable than one I have in my airplane that I've flown for nine hundred and fifty hours. I mean, I felt like I was completely task saturated operating an airplane, much less an instrument approach or anything else. And I, I think there was a couple of times when Nathan could said, Ben, what's your name? And I'm going to have to tell him to stand by. I just, you know, so I, I think there's some, we put some unrealistic expectations as midlifers. I don't know. Maybe you see that uh, more so with the, the younger groups. I, 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 if you're asking me, I, there, that is true. There's a higher expectation of yourselves. And one of the things I had a flight this morning with uh, a midlifer and I wrote, you know, I take notes while they're flying in my, in big, bold letters for him. I just said, relax, like just relax. <laughs> That's don't, you yeah. know, don't be so hard on yourself. Like you're saying, Ben, like just relax up there and let it flow and you'll right. fly so much better and safer in the end. Right. So um, the midlifer also has more, I guess it's more humble, I'd say, and open to, um, criti- you know, constructive criticism, feedback, whereas, you know, you know, some other groups may be like, well, you know, I nailed this landing. Of course, I'm, 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 I'm wonderful, but, uh, right, right. You know, well, the thing that gets me by the way, is just that I feel as, um, in terms of my instincts and my reaction times and my perception of things and, you know, controlling, you know, drive, whatever it is I'm doing, I feel like I'm the same as I ever was. I feel like my reaction times and my instincts are, are just as good as they ever was, uh, or ever were. And (laughs) I think, um, I think that for me, it was just, um, kind of defeating because I realized that that decay had happened over such a protracted period of time that I had no awareness of that at all. And when you talk about that, um, malleability, um, I feel like that that's part of that. And the, the thing, you know, for me, it was, 
I think what a huge contributing factor is, Nate, is that we in midlife have decided to be locked in in life already for a long time in the things that we're already good at and have yeah. we're actually maybe people that are uh so experienced in our fields or whatever that perhaps people come to us for you know instruction or guidance or we're the kind of maybe the quasi experts in whatever our realms are and to just go from your life being made of all of those sort of mini knowledge empires to all of a sudden just being an idiot who can't even do the most basic things. And just, to, we just haven't been just sucked at something in so long. Um, I think that that's a, a huge part of it. It is. I, I, I mean, it's a good point. And one of the things also with the midlifer though, you know, Brian, you're going after it or whoever is going after it because you really want it. Right. And there's that desire and that motivation we talked about in the beginning. And you become this uh, sponge for knowledge. You're looking for more ways to improve, more ways to be safer. Um, and that's such a benefit to being, you know, learning how to fly or advancing your flying in midlife because you recognize that you, you know what you don't know and you want to find out, right? And that's a great point. Yeah, no one's no one knows everything, but you re actually recognize hopefully that there's a lot I'm, I need to learn. That's that's spot on. Um, real quick in the chat, I have to address Mr. Tarantelli's comments. Um, I demoted myself. I actually have a check ride coming up this week, and I am in full student mode, so that's why I changed my yeah. name. So just for student the record, student sage. Yes. So kind of tangential to that, it's as as. I was in training. I know this is true of other people. I'll say we to, you know, make it not just about me, but you can include me. We, we kind of, okay. Ben and I kind of hit a wall. Uh, I, you know, like mine, I always say was like between hour eight and 20, where it's like, I am not advancing. I don't know that I'll actually be able to figure this out. Like pre solo. And there's, there's no way I trust myself in a plane at that point. And just not, you know, I just feel like I'm just treading water. Do you, do you see that? What do you, what do you do about that? How, you know, it, how common is that? And are, are there people that don't progress? That happens all the time. That plateau where you're just, you know, the eight to 20 hours, like you're talking about at that stage, you're, you're out there beating up the pattern, you're doing oh, yeah. stall after stall, you're hitting these emergency procedures. And that's where, and again, I don't know anything. This is just my style. It's, as soon as you see that you need to have fun, right? Yeah. Hey, Let's go to St. Simon's and get barbecue. Let's do that first cross country. Let's have some fun in the air instead of just, you know, worrying about were you seven degrees off your heading and when you recover from your power off stall. <laughs> Who yeah. cares, right? Just have yeah. some fun. So I think that's probably at least that would be my my remedy there. Hopefully, uh, let's yeah. let's bring some fun back in the air. That's awesome, Ted. Did you have something else? Well, yeah. I mean, are there people that get stuck at that point though, or is that does that always resolve itself in your, it, I mean, you know, kind of in your experience, obviously, but I'd, I'd say most, I'd say it almost always resolves itself if the person wants to continue. Um, yeah. and you just, you know, you, you, you just take a different direction if that's the case. Yeah. Does it happen a lot? It happened. Yes. It happens a lot. It happens with at any level, you know, private I mean, student all the way up to instrument. And, you know, as far as it goes, it, it definitely happens a lot. And, um, and it's pretty apparent when it happens because the the student pilot whomever is going to be you know the frustration is going to show yeah so let me ask this we had um someone on our discord server i couldn't find the email um they they they've taken their check ride they're a private pilot and they're now starting to explore they're going out on cross countries and they're taking friends with them but this particular person said he has found himself getting the jitters um, post getting his and, and s several of us in the in the discord chat said, go up with a CFI, you know, address those. But I I'm curious, what would you how would you address that? That it, and it happened to me. Um, it was a uh, Nordo experience and, and it really shook me. Now, it wasn't. I mean, I got in, it was fine. And I look back on it now, it was really not that big of a deal. But at the time, and you know, a radio went out. It's not the end of the world. But it it caused me to 
maybe not take the next flight that I was planning on taking because I was I was shaken up by it. So what's your recommendation there? I would say, yes, go up with CFI, figure out what it is. But I wouldn't just shun the jitter. I wouldn't shun the nervousness saying, well, I, you, know, you know, something's wrong. I shouldn't go fly. I took my daughter and two of her, her friends on a flight. And do you think I had the jitters when I took them recently? Yeah. Like, I, you know, it makes me nervous because I'm putting yeah. my – my daughter and her friends in the air. I I feel like I have pretty good experience and everything's going to be okay, but there's always that, you know, there's that inherent risk to what we do. So um, I'd say, don't, don't feel bad about being nervous. Everybody's going to get nervous at some point or have something come up. And I think somebody put it in the chat, like that's such a good opportunity to learn. Right. And, and to figure out, you know, why am I, why is this? Is it because I, you know, I'm uncomfortable around clouds or I don't like busy airports. Like, and that's the time, like you said, Ben, like go get somebody to go fly with you and take a little bit of that pressure off and experience that, what it is you're nervous about. That was uh, Dan B uh, about a month ago that asked that. And he, he said uh, jitters and spooks was the other word that he used, but he said he just read killing zone and he thought maybe that was part of it. <laughs> and that that's a great book to read or reread about the time you do your check ride, I think. But um, it's also the time, like right after your check ride, was like, how how do I expand my minerals? Uh, how do I get comfortable with the things that my license says I can do now? And it, that that was for me was very specific to that that time period of right after is. I know I'm, this is the worst that I'm going to be as a pilot. So, <laughs> you know, how do I, how do I improve from here? I mean, I, you know, when you're, when you finish a check ride, you're, you're generally like pretty, you're pretty good, but you, you, yeah. you, you're, 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 you're in the lanes of the ACS, right? Which is just, yeah. here's what you have to do to pass, pass, just pass this check ride, but it's not the real life stuff you're going to do. So you gotta, you just have to get out there and do it. Probably the, Number one thing that I see that maybe I'm not sure causes the jitters, but these things is you get your, you get your, your ticket and you stop flying. You go from flying three times a week to once a month. It's all going yeah. away. Like, yeah. so you, you gotta, you gotta keep practicing. You gotta keep practicing. Yeah. Um, I think the one thing that happens too, is that um, a lot of people, not everybody, some people's training is more protracted over time. Uh, and I would imagine for a lot of midlifers, that's the case because you're trying to fit it in where you can. Um, but I would say seems by and large, most people kind of get after it, you know, uh, because we do want to save time and money. And we realize that that is the way to do it. Um, it's also just how to have uh, more knowledge actually stick. But I guess what that means, though, is that you're generally going to be learning everything within a time frame of say spring and the summer that you trained for your private. So in that time frame, you know, a little bit changes, the weather maybe changes a little bit. Maybe there's a couple little things around the airport that you're used to, you know, but once you get past that and once you've gotten your certificate and once you get out there, all of a sudden, all the, these sort of micro variables start to kind of present themselves and I think that that is the subtext or the driver for, I think, a lot of these kind of uh, nervous sort of first hundred hours after PPL is because you're out of the nest. The government and some dude named Nate has said, you can do this. You're fine. And then you're <laughs> thinking, I'm barely fine in the, in the construct of environments <laughs> that I know and understand. Yeah. And now it's like, you know, leave the nest, go fly, be free. And it's, it's, uh, there's a lot to stare down. There's a lot to, to look at. And, you know, I just, I was even thinking about it when I was flying today, just about, um, there was probably three or four things that happened that were very notable things that were either almost mistakes or, weird things, variables that came up that made me, um, you know, I, I reacted to them in a much, I'm relaxed now because I've got some basis, but when you're early on, especially I think as a midlifer, you don't have as much of that. You're, I think less likely to have a bad pilot attitude, right. Or feel like you're invincible. Cause you know, when you're st staring mortality in the face, like we are naturally without the risk of flying, uh, that's not a concern, but but uh, but ultimately, like today, I was uh, going downwind to base, and uh, 172 came was flying 
opposite corner, like not even in the traffic flow of the pattern of this airport, a hundred feet above us, 200 feet above us. I mean, I could read the tail number and it was one of the, the shock of first of, is that, I mean, it was just right there. We were like, Oh my God. And I just stayed cool. And I just kept on my, you know, I just stayed predictable, but started descending and kind of just saw what was going on. They were not talking. Uh, they definitely didn't respond to my, um, cheerful conversation. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, they were not on ADSB, nothing. And, and then it's one of those things too, when you analyze it after the fact, you're thinking, okay, they're a high wing, we're a low wing. They should have seen us, but they were not acting like they saw us at all. And then I thought, oh my gosh, if, if I was flying on 172, we probably wouldn't have seen them. Um, and it starts to kind of cascade like that, but ultimately everything was fine. You know, um, today they said, you know, taxi out after this Baron, but there was a Baron way down the taxiway. I didn't realize that they were talking about the Baron that was coming up this way. And I almost kind of <laughs> jumped the gun on that Baron. You know, there's just all these little, when you're learning those, just those little idiosyncratic things. I think we get really caught up in maneuvers and ACS standards and all these things, which you should be. But I think that in the, in the actual reality of flying, once you get out there, it's just all these little micro incidents of, you know, confusion or uncertainty or, fear um you know do you do you feel like that the private pilot training really i mean there's no way that that can prepare you for all of the variables there it, it does not um the way i like to say it is or, or explain it or when people ask is you know i went to college i got a degree what i used in my career i, I learned about 10 percent in college 90 percent has been on the job and it's kind of the same thing. If, if you pass your check ride, the government is saying, all right, you get a C, basically. I mean, you may get an A plus on it. However, you just need a C. So the real learning that has to take place for you to be a safe, proficient pilot is you going out there and doing it. And like, Brian, you went to Marfa. You did tailwheel. I, I would, I don't know. I would just hazard, hazard a guess that like your Marf, Marfa trip, you learned probably more than you'd learned in any other cross-country trip. You got real density altitude experience, right? New airports, new terrain. Mm. I mean, I'm not speaking for you, but yeah, um, no, it was yeah. I mean, every every bit of the types of weather and the lay of the land, everything I saw was all like the whole deck had gotten shuffled. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, and that's what I think is important is is going out and flying other planes. Um, in preparing for my check ride, I filled out for the first time in a long time my minimums, my personal minimums which is really weird to do at this point in time because oh, it used to be yeah. really easy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, IFR, well, my uh, how many feet above minimums? Well, I, I've shot a dozen or so approaches to minimum. So, I mean, it, it but it didn't feel right. I, I feel like I'm not being a safe person when I'm like, oh, I'm a hot shot pilot. I'm going to go. That's my minimums is the minimums. It's It's not like that, but it's, Every time I've expanded my deck, I guess, or to what you're saying, you're learning, was usually by accident. It was, I learned how to fly in the summer because I took a trip and I didn't have an IFR ticket. And then I got stuck down somewhere. I had a buddy tell me, if you're going to fly in South Georgia in the summer, you need to be where you're going by one o'clock and you're not going to leave after that. And he, he was pretty much right. It's, it's that experience and how you expand what you're comfortable at doing and you're going to have jitters while you do it just to kind of wrap a bow on this. That's that jitters means that you're, you're expanding, you're leveling up, so to speak. Um, Nate, is, Nate, is there any hope for us? <laughs> I, I, listen, if you, like we were talking about, like if you're, if you're in this, at this stage in your life, you have that thirst, like you want it. So of course yeah. there's hope. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You just got to get out there and keep doing it. We got yeah. some feedback from, um, um, Sean W. You want to go ahead and talk about? Let me pull up a couple of comments here and then and then ask a question. But uh, uh, Elliot Cox, uh, Mr. Lightning Strike this week, uh, noted that a DPE friend of his said most candidates don't know how to use FBOs. It's not something you learn in training. Totally true. And you know, it's we've we've talked about that on here. We've talked. Um, Chris C was talking about that. Like, where do I park my plane at a new airport? The, they're they're the thing this is what you learn from uh check ride to the first 30 hours after the check ride it seems it, it, it is and 
And I'll, I'll say about that, there's so much of that that is not taught. It's, I mean, yeah. it could be the FBO. How do you do that? Or where do I park my plane? How do I start a cold engine? Like, what are, what are all these yeah. things that are going to happen in the real world that is not in the ACS, it's not on your syllabus, but you're going to have to deal with? So, yeah. I mean, that's a great comment that he put so, in there. So my question for you uh, was, I've been wanting to hear, what, what's your flying story? When did you start motivation? What got you to here? Oh, uh, I'll keep this brief to not make all the listeners leave right now. But uh, <laughs> I was a 17 year old private pilot, instrument commercial, right, you know, right in a row. Come from a flying family. My dad was an Air Force Delta guy. My mom has her commercial multi. My granddad was an Army, um, Army Air Force or World War wow. II um, flight instructor. So it's kind of yeah. it's kind it wasn't an expectation. Like it was just there. So I I took the opportunity. However, much like probably a lot of us. Uh, maybe that had that path or in midlife, I took a break, right? College life, kids. Yeah. And then, you know, several years ago, I was like, oh, you know, I kind of like that. And I always like, you know, my, my day-to-day job, I, I do a lot of teaching and instructing and coaching. I was like, well, I really want to do that. And um, that's when I got into like, just dove right in with instruction and like, how can I, how can I take what I hopefully know from my other world, or, you know, life experience, bring it into aviation to make us safer, right? Where are the gaps? I mean, that's kind of what I enjoy doing right now is like trying to find those things that we talk about in flying that we t- have been talking about for 80 years that haven't changed. And I like to say, why are we doing that? Right. Or is that really yeah. what we need to be talking about? Or is there something better? Um, so that's where I am now. Just, I am a part-time CFI and only take a handful of people and I, and I love every bit of it. He, he's very good at it. Uh, by the way, he's got a YouTube channel, youtube.com yeah. slash Nathan Ballard. Is that right? Nathan Ballard, safe for flying. That That's it. Yeah. Um, he takes a different approach in how, especially if you're a CFI, but things that you don't always think about very poignant to the topic we're just talking about everything that we need to learn after we get our PPL. And, um, that's actually where I first came in contact with him with his YouTube channel. And then, um, we kind of connected after that. Um, one more feedback, uh, from Sean W who apparently is working on his instrument rating. I work on my instrument with other pilots. It is clear. There are easy, what easier ways to build your instrument time with being able to flight share. There's a lot of misnomers out there about how to do it and properly to do it properly and log the time. This would be a good thing to talk about as I'm sure a lot of midlifers look to get their instrument after their private pilot. So um, can you help uh, some of these midlifers understand when you can log um, the IFR time? Yes. Um, if you go on Facebook and ask her and get a hundred different answers, that's a <laughs> right. fact, right? Right. So, um, you know, that's one thing you, you need to go to the source, right? You need to go to the, to, to the regulations. However, before, you know, if you want all that kind of put into a, a summary, AOPA has one of the best summaries Just search AOPA, you know, PIC considerations or, or a, a, you know, acting versus logging PIC. That's going to be your best bet. You know, they can cite all the regulations. Um, but for the mid lifer or someone that's, you know, in instrument training, Really, the key to success is, yeah, you got to grind through some of those hours, right? You're going to have to do some safety pilot stuff with another private, um, uh, with another private pilot. That that's really good for just checking a box, just getting that that number of hours. Is the experience that great? Probably not, um, but it's something you, you have to do, and that's you know probably one thing that's we could go on a, on a tangent on some of our hour requirements. But the best instrument candidates I see come to me, you know, haven't checked those boxes, but they've done their written, they've done their study, they're, you know, they're ready to get after it and not, um, you know, not just start from the beginning. So if you use that time where you're doing some safety pilot stuff, where you're getting some of that PIC time shared and getting that, you know, simulated instrument time, great, but try to make it, you know, not just, hey, I'm going to fly to St. Simon's in a straight line. I try to do something with it instead of just, right. um, um, trying to check that box of having X number of hours. Hear that, Ben? 
I do <laughs> hear that. Don't, don't fly to St. Simons. Stop <laughs> in flying straight in line. straight lines. Well, no, yeah. not in a straight line. So I'm going to just make as many stops as I can now. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and I will say this. I, I've stopped filing IFR almost every single time now. I used to do it every single time regardless of the weather. Um, but I do kind of I'm, – I'm taking the Brian Siskin approach. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, go and explore that quarry that I saw the other time or – uh, whatever the case may be. Um, I, I've been reading the a lot in the chat. There's a lot of people in our chat right now who have never pumped gas until yeah. maybe even after their PPL. So I think to boost my YouTube channel, which only has three videos on it, is I want to go do uh, how to pump your own fuel, because at least <laughs> there's a dozen people that I know that might want to can learn from it. That's a, that's a real thing. Um, I, I didn't get shown any of that stuff. Just had to go figure it out. But um, but so so Nate, I have a, a question for you. I'm curious. So I'm really fascinated by. I mean, I don't know. I know that there's a thing that CFIs, uh, some sort of secret crypt of information that you have <laughs> access to. You know, that's uh, the fundamentals of instruction or whatever they call it, right? Whatever your oh, yeah. FOI, yeah. Yep. Whatever your whatever your strange credo is. That's got like, I don't know. I'm sure it's like an elaborate brass apparatus with <laughs> beams of light coming out of it that yeah. you know um in that i know that there are things that are about the psychology of instruction um and i think if if there's any part of me that ever might be interested in being an instructor i think that this is the part of it that i think would be most fascinating and i wonder about what your experience is but just reading a, reading a person that you probably don't know, taking in all the subtle little cues, you know, your brain's doing all these calculations about probably like how they handle their pen or is their stuff organized? Are they in a hurry? Um, do they have an awkward laugh? Uh, do they talk on a podcast and keep saying things in the same tone over and over again? No, but, um, <laughs> but just do you... Do you have in your reads on people, I suppose is maybe the way to call it. Um, do you ever find that maybe you had it all wrong about someone? Like I can see maybe a situation where you just thought, wow, this is going to be a long, this is going to be an uphill journey for this very well-meaning uh, student. And then for whatever reason, they're just unconsciously sort of a wizard and they're nailing everything. You know, do you have things where you just get it kind of totally wrong? Yes. I would say in my, early part of my instruction you know you look at somebody like i know what that person's going to be about but now you know you wait right let's I, I love to see when i fly with somebody for the first time i love to see you know how do they you know what's their what's their mindset are they safety oriented are they using checklists you know how are they like commanding the airplane to do what they want it to do it's the and those you know i guess it's those little things you just start to pick up like you know where where are they in their aviation journey i mean certainly I've made that mistake of saying, well, this person has, I've flown with people that have 30,000 hours and I think I'm going to do nothing on this flight. Right. <laughs> and some of those 30,000 hour pilots are the ones that like try to kill you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you just really, that, that is one of the, in that secret credo of CFIs, like one of the, the things that will, you know, you know, is a killer of CFIs and, and eight people in the aviation community, it's complacency, right? If you just assume that the person is going to do this or, or whatnot, that, as soon as you get relaxed, um, the aviation, aviation will punch you in the face, right? <laughs> and remind you that um, you better be on your toes. That has happened more times than I would <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, well, and I guess I was just curious also about like in those scenarios too, where maybe you had like now, so I appreciate what you're saying. Now I wait, now I let it develop. Um, there's sort of two spinoff questions I have. Uh, one, maybe a little shorter answer, one, maybe a longer form. The first shorter answer is, do you have some weird idiosyncratic tell that's just in your head? That's the one thing that if they, you know, it's just, I don't know, just, there's, it's just, it, the, I don't know, just some stupid thing, like the way that they do this or the way that they handle this control, or if they forget this one thing, that's the thing, like, that's the sign. Like if you have, a, you have like one thing you kind of fixate on as being like, that's the tell. Yes. <laughs> All it. right. Here's the secret. Okay. Okay. So if you get in the airplane and I see that you are deathly afraid of the red mixture knob, 
I know. I know yeah. we're going to, we, we have some work to do. Um, okay. But I know. I would not expect that. that. That's why, why, it's why just, do you say that? Because it's not something like you can fly around all day long with the mixture rich, right? Is it doing, you know, is it building up, you know, deposits in your engine? Yeah, it probably is. Right. Is it taught in the ACS that you need to lean your engine? It's not. But if you've gotten to that, you know, if, you, if you've gotten to the point where you realize I need to take care of the airplane, which is taking care of me, I, that makes me realize, okay, they, they, you know, they probably, maybe they don't, they don't know all the, the reasons why we, we lean the mixture, but they know they, it's something they need to do to pro, to treat that airplane properly. So it will treat them properly. That's probably okay. my one tell. Yeah. That's my thing. Okay, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be dominating the conversation here because that just brings up one more thing. I've been thinking about this a lot. As midlifers, we all grew up, you know, if if the lawnmower's broke, you got to fix it. it. You know, uh, we we have, I think, more than maybe kids coming up now, a sense of how combustion engines work and how basic systems work because these are old technologies or whatever. Um, but I guess the, do you find that systems knowledge or just the fun, like if you're trying to explain the mixture to someone, you're kind of having to relationally explain how an engine works. <laughs> do you, do, do you find that, uh, that's kind of getting lost more on people now because they don't really have, uh, you know, um, poor parents that are forcing you to mow the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> for, I'll, I'll say this I'll, I'll be i'm going to be delicate with this with for the people that want to want aviation and to learn aviation because they want it because they're passionate about it they do have that drive and the desire to 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 learn why do we lean the mixture for the for the people that are using it as a stepping stone to fly bigger airplanes it, it's not as much of a concern and yeah 10 second story. I have a CFI friend who just went to work for a big school in a different state and they have dozens and dozens of planes and their operating procedures specifically say, do not lean the mixture because oh. they're scared that the students are going to lean it too much. So, I mean, they're causing themselves, you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars in maintenance and probably, you know, earlier engine teardowns. But it's just not right, right? That's not how yeah. we fly. So, man. Right. Okay. Well, it, I, do it, have one more I do have one more thing. Sorry. I'm sorry, Ted. I'm so sorry. This is my last thing. Do you have a thing where when students are not, what do you do when a student's done the same thing over and over and over again and you've got to tell them something the, the thousandth way, you know, how to understand or how to do something? How do, you, how do you get past that wall and how do you deal with your own frustrations when you're at that point? A lot of times that's going to, that reflects on me, right? If, if I haven't, if I'm telling something, the same, something, you know, 10 times, I'm not delivering the message properly. You know, if you look back and I'm going to go nineties basketball, if you look back at like the nineties, 1990s bulls, right. And you ask Phil Jackson, like, you know, why do you treat Michael Jordan differently than, you know, <laughs> whoever else, so Bill yeah. Cartwright or whoever it's because they're, they're different, right? They learn differently or they perform differently. So that's me. My job as a coach, I need to figure out how do I connect with you? If I tell you 10 times something and you don't know, I, that's me not doing my job right. That's the way I see it at least. So I have a quick story about that. When I was doing PPL training, I was struggling with steep turns. Uh, holding the engine up in my airplane can be challenging at times. I had one instructor who was definitely, who made no bones about it. He was at 1,450 hours and was putting <laughs> his resumes in and, you know, and, you know, he kept pounding on the dash, look outside, look outside, don't look inside. Um, he went off literally like two weeks later. And then I got another guy who I really liked and I guess he had told him that I was struggling with the, this maneuver. And so he went and got a towel and he just covered up the dash <laughs> and, and I was forced to look outside and of course everything got better. It's um, it's the different styles that you're talking about. And um, so, yeah, I, I thought that was uh, very intuitive of him trying to come up with a different way to pound something into this thick head of mine. So I, I, 
I, I see that I've, I saw it with myself and I've seen it with, with other people where it's like, kind of like, if you're starting to struggle a little bit, go up with another CFI. And I, I'm saying that because I assume there's at least a handful of students listening to this. If you've never flown with a second CFI, even if your CFI is fantastic, fly with another one. You, you learn different things, you get different styles. Even if everything is completely right from the first CFI, you get the different style from the second one. And, you know, so yeah, it's not just it's a great oh, well, point. It's not just you're a, a bad CFI or you're a bad student for the CFI. It's also just like get more experience with more CFIs. And yeah. Ted, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. And uh, I, you know, I sit here, I'm, I'm an instructor. I don't know everything. And, you know, Ben, I, you know, Ben That's why we had you on, though, Nate. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, you know than you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sometimes the fit is just not there. Maybe a personality thing. And I've had people like flog me and I never hear from them again. And that's okay. Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm not their style. Uh, and some people, you know, are like they're not my style. Right. Yeah. Ted, you're absolutely right. You got to, you can't just take, you know, one person's word for it because there's a lot of different ways to, to, to do it. Uh, so there's been a good discussion in the in the comments more about who's refueled, who hasn't, and we've got some high hour pilots that have never refueled. But uh, the one reminder there was that uh, Wendell Geek did a, a video on how to fuel, and oh, I put that up as a background. There's a uh, anyway, he, he's got a good video. We'll link it in the doobly doo of, of uh, um, you know actually fueling your plane. So at least at least one of us has done that video. So you can you can watch it. So now and I don't have the, to worry about it. Thank God. Yeah. On the other hand, the things that, that a CFI teaches are the things that keep you from dying. So learning how to go through an FBO is kind of less important than, you know, spinning on final. Well, and, and not to mention that uh, one of my most impacting things that I read in the killing zone was uh, I believe it was a couple of experienced pilots or maybe they were both instructors but they stopped somewhere, they got fuel, they both thought the other guy got it, they both, oh, they left yeah. both fuel caps off and took off and ended up having a fuel exhaustion situation. And, um, you know, that begs sort of the double-edged thing of, you know, there's nothing more dangerous than a plane full of pilots uh, <laughs> thing that I learned from a guy. And then also just, um, you know, if, if somebody's even, if somebody's doing something for you, the odds of something not being right are even that much greater and you need to be all over it. And the funny thing was, is that I read that in the killing zone and then I had a, a lesson either the same day or the next day. And I went out, we, me and my instructor got in the plane for the lesson. FBO came out, fueled us up It was a 172. So it was, you know, you can't see what they're kind of doing really. And we actually got in the plane and you know how it is. Like once you kind of get in the plane, it's, it's like, do you really want to get out to, you know, look at something, you know, uh, or whatever you really got to, you know, yeah. and, and I told my instructor, I said, look, I just read this thing. We, I, did you check? I didn't check. And I just read this thing. And, and I, I think he thought I was a little bit of, you know, paranoid or crazy. And sure enough, uh, the line guy had left one of the caps off and that, it just that was a, uh, the the odds of because that's never happened in any other scenario ever except for the one time where I was really hyper focused on it right after I had read about it. So be mindful that if you have people doing stuff for you, you've got to real. It's up to you to go behind them. Don't expect anything to be right. So uh, want to put it out to the those watching on YouTube. If you got any questions, uh, send them in now. I uh, want to take this time uh, to remind everybody that you can uh, support us at Spotify for as little as 25 cents uh, episode. If we keep doing this on a weekly basis, uh, minimum, uh, send us your feedback. We love getting it. Um, we, I will respond as quickly as possible, or one of us will. Uh, Midlife Pilot Podcast at gmail.com. All of this will be in the show notes. I'm sorry, the doobly doos. Doobly doo. Yep. Uh, I'm not, and there's one other major <laughs> item uh, that I want to uh, address that's not necessarily Nate related, but we do get a lot of feedback of people saying, I don't know if I qualify as a midlifer. And um, I just want to say, uh, as my friend, my co host said, we're all in the midst of something, we're all midlifers. So we're not exclusive here. We want you to join us. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. There's nothing more midlife than saying, I'm not sure if I'm a midlifer. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, 
I don't hey, care Nate, if you're eight or eighty. You're a midlife. Yeah. <laughs> hey yeah. Nate, um, do you do you do you want to see uh, being a CFI and looking out at all of us schmucks trying to make our way? Um, do you want to see more people become CFIs? Wouldn't you like to see Ben become a CFI? What would you tell somebody that's on the maybe just had it in their mind that they might want to be a CFI? I think Ben, don't get a big head here. I think he'd be an excellent CFI, right? He's good at talking. That's really hard for a lot of people. And and the thing you need to have to be a good CFI, you have to have the drive and the passion and desire to be immersed in this, you know, to make sure that everybody gets home safe after every flight. Ben clearly has that. And you know, one of your previous guests, and I've told him this before, um, who is known on the internet, internet for being funny, I've told Brian Turner, like, he needs to be a CFI, right? He like, yeah. Because he's he's such a student, right? If you look at his his multi engine stuff, like he's a student, he absorbs it, and that's the kind of person you want to pass yeah. it on, right? Because they they know what it means, you know, to learn and then to pass that on. So anybody, you know, honestly, anybody, you know, Ted, Brian, Ben, anybody that we interface with on you know in this in on the discord server like because you have that desire to learn and talk about things that have happened and 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 get better and get safer that's who we need to see if that's 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 who we really desperately need being instructors out there i i do think um one of my biggest fears is that i would be a good instructor and i've kind of got it into my head <laughs> that i don't want to do it and i'm scared i might enjoy it too much so um I don't know. Well, we'll cross that bridge. I got a couple of years to go before uh, I can do something on that. Um, oh, wait, I have one more thing. Oh, sorry, Nate, how do you trick students into realizing or how do you trick students into thinking that they actually did something right on a landing when you're oh. how do you sneak control inputs without them seeing it? I, I, you know what? I, this, it's, <laughs> it's funny. One of the things I tell everybody first time I fly with you, you're going to see me shift my hands and feet. It doesn't matter if you're a 10 hour pilot or 80 billion hour pilot. I'm going to be ready. Um, and they'll know that I, I'm not going to sneak in anything, you know, with the amount of hours that I've taught now. Um, but I can tell on short final or even, you know, mile, mile and a half final, I, I can tell you how the landing's going to go <laughs> yeah. before yeah. we even get close to that pavement. So, <laughs> oh, I used to love how like my CFI would have his coffee and, you know, it'd be early in the morning. And you could just, I could already tell like, we're on final and he starts to look for a place to put his coffee. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I already know, like I'm not doing something right. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to point out uh, for our friend, uh, AJ Alpha Juliet, um, you'll probably get a discount because I'm getting the upcharge. Um, <laughs> flying with me is not the easiest thing in the world. So uh, AJ was talking get... about doing his commercial uh, out of Atlanta. Uh, nice. You, you three, AJ, Nathan, Ben are all in the Atlanta area. And yeah, I, I, I think that passes this, this check ride. Like he can knock that CFI out. There's, there's your new instructor right there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. God <laughs> help us all. So speaking of, of distractions, uh, Jeff asked the question just a minute ago. Um, do you, uh, do you just, do you try to tr distract students to see if they'll tell you to be quiet or do you just, uh, I, I can't even word, I can't even say that. Do you let you, do they do let you, you distract them? Just let them yeah, thank I, you. Every once in a while on final, I'll start talking about football or whatever. Not so often. <laughs> a lot of times when they tell me to be quiet, I had the, the guy today, I was telling him something about, blah, 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 you know, whatever, because we like to talk. And he told me to be quiet. And at the end of the lesson, I said, that was the best thing you did today. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. never, ever be afraid to tell somebody, shut up, I'm flying the airplane. And and the DPE, the CFI, who your passengers, they'll all be like, this this. This person's got it, so definitely do that. But, Not on uh, lesson two, though. Right. I, I, I found myself over 200 feet low coming into downwind because I'm just chatting the ear off this, this like, alternate CFI that I had. And I was like, hang on. We're having a great conversation. But I am, like, when you're that far off, you realize, like, you can't do this. And that was, that probably, I learned more from that than if if he had said something. He was like, man being 200 feet off on, on downwind is not where you want to be as a student. No. So what you're telling me is when my DPE for Friday starts talking to me on final, <laughs> I just need to tell him to shut the hell up. 
<laughs> and say it in those words. Yeah. And uh, Elliot and the Cox knows the DPE. I'm curious how he would react to that way. No, I will tell him I need a sterile cockpit, but yeah, I won't sterile cockpit about it. Below 10,000 feet. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Because that's the commercial. I want to throw one more thing about, about distractions. I'm not trying to talk too much. Here. That's what CFIs do. Please. The number one distraction I see today with midlife pilots, any H pilot really is fixation on their iPad and inside, especially as VFR pods. You need to be looking outside. It is, it's, it is so pervasive these days. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, I'd say 90% of the people I fly with are just like looking down. And that's where Ben, like you said, the guy put, or the person put the towel over the, you know, instruments right. for you. Like, yeah, look outside. So if there's a takeaway from this, like, you know, try to look outside more. Nate, is there anything that we haven't covered that you just really want to make sure that you said? I mean, I think you were pumping us up a lot earlier. Maybe that was before we went online. But um, no, but is there is there anything that you just feel like you want to communicate to our listeners or anything we haven't covered? The only thing I'll kind of reference back to what I said earlier, like if you see something in aviation that's been that way forever, it's okay to to question it, right? And I, I commented, gosh, a couple of days ago about – here's how much time you have before your fuel runs out. Right. And I, I think it was, I, I can't remember exactly who it was, but they called me out on it and they said, no, it's actually X, Y, Z seconds. And I'm like, you know what? I just, I pulled that out of, you know, folklore that somebody had been telling me for, you know, we've been passing down forever. And that's the thing we all need to challenge, right? We need to, you know, if something has been said for forever, like let's, figure, let's see if, that, if that's the real truth. Yeah. Well, and that one was an, is an easy one to test. That was in, in Discord. Yeah. And the conversation was, if if you don't have fuel, if you set your selector to off or whatever we have it, how long will your engine run at idle? How long will it run with some amount of RPM? And yeah, and yeah it, was, it was like, oh, this is a good question. I'll have to go test this. Because you can do that on the ground. Just, just shut off the fuel. See, see how long it runs. Like, that's relatively safe to do. I like, this. I like this. This is your legacy, Nate. It's uh, we yeah. can even say, you know, this is the guy that said the buck stops here. If something seems suspect, that might be a long time tradition. You can Ballard it. <laughs> <laughs> I call Ballard. Yeah, I like it. I got to trademark Full. that real quick. Okay. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> what, so everybody, you can. Yeah, One please. Question for you, Nathan. How, what got you into the video editing? Because your your video editing skills are great. Um, yeah. We're, we're going to link to that in the doobly doo. But but the uh, what you do is really well done. I appreciate it. I, one of my, I guess it's I don't know, um, character issues is that I study things too much. And you know, when I decided I wanted to try to put some content out there, I was like, I don't know, this really has to be good. So I started studying and studying and studying, and then. One day I was like, enough, I got to put it out there. And if it's good enough, it's good enough. But um, that's probably, that's probably the, the reason is because I've just spent too much time in the pitching <laughs> resolve and lighting and sound and all kinds of stuff. But uh, it's great, but, man. You do great stuff though. It, and I love how really condensed is. and thoughtful it is. Yeah. I, Nathan I Ballard, know. Safer Flying is his YouTube channel. Everyone, please go give it a subscribe because he really does put great material out. I appreciate that. And thanks for having me here for this conversation. This is, this is fantastic. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. What else do we need to cover? Um, we have a meetup in April, April 26th through the 28th. Um, we fly have in. a, it's a fly in meetup fly in. <laughs> What's the difference? Uh, I, I, like a thousand bucks. Okay. <laughs> um, we have a form out there. Don't we, Ted, that we do. people can access. Yeah, there's an RSVP form and uh, you can give your level of interest. If you're like, maybe I'll make it, maybe not. There's there's space for that on the form. Uh, How do they and, access the form? Remind uh, me, it'll, I'm sorry. It'll be in the doobly-doo uh, in, the, in the show notes. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, starting to you know see a lot of responses from that and start to kind of figure this thing out. So. No, we've actually gotten a crazy amount of responses. And if even yeah. a quarter of them show up, it's going to be a hell of a time. So I really hope that people uh, fill this form out. Let us know. Uh, we wanted to call it a save the date, I guess, but we didn't. No, but it's a, <laughs> it's an RSVP. But definitely um, look to come to Nashville because um, 
you know, I, I can't handle all these bachelorettes by myself, right? <laughs> As Elliot put it earlier, it'd be the white claw crawl. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but so, it'd, be a, it'd be a great time. There's some really good flying around here. Um, for those that haven't flown in this particular area, I mean, it's it's got its own sort of challenges with the airspace, but it's all very manageable. Um it's it's pretty. Uh, there's a lot of places to go, a lot of options, and we're all going to be right next to the airport, which is right next to not the B and A airport, the big one, the Class Charlie, but the Delta John Toon. We'll be based out of there. There's so many things to to do, but what we've you know, as much as we're going to be doing a lot of flying and all these things, the best part is always just hanging out with each other and and the hangs and uh, and all that. So uh, super stoked! Uh, everybody get those forms in. Yeah, yeah. Let us know how you feel. Um, that's that's about it for tonight. Uh, anything else we need to cover, fellas? Uh, in two weeks, we're going to have a, a big end-of-the-year extravaganza show. Uh, expect it to be a little longer, a little less podcasty, a little more video. So More whiskey? Making some plans for that. Sure, Ooh. more whiskey. It's all information whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I love it. Nathan, thanks again for joining us tonight. And everybody in the chat, we appreciate your participation. We're glad you're with us tonight. And signing off, episode 53 of the Midlife Pilot Podcast. Good night, everybody. Night.